This is a stick insect. It may look fairly conspicuous on my hand, although I've made an effort to make it feel at home with my shirt. But you'd have to see it in its really natural surroundings in order to see it at its best. There, it would blend in almost totally. The attention to detail is astonishing. You can even see little marks suggesting bark on its back. You could almost say that it fits its environment like a key fits a lock. And I've got something else under my hat. This is a different kind of stick insect, a leaf insect. Uh, it mainly resembles leaves, dead leaves. You see how it rocks like that. I suspect that it's got a second line of defense, which is that when it's, when it's startled and when a bird might almost have got it, it then, I suspect, mimics a scorpion. You see how the tail has looped over the back there. If I saw that, I might be momentarily startled, thinking that it was a scorpion. And let's put these away. I think Bryson can deal with that one. I may have to call for a volunteer who's not frightened of stick insects. There we are. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bryce and I are always doing double acts like this. <laughs> right. On with them. Whoops. Here are a couple more. Here are a couple more. There's a branch of a tree. It seems to be moving. There goes its head. It's a bird. It flies off. A potu. Those are rose thorns. That's not a rose thorn. It's a bug. It gains protection by looking like a rose thorn. You could almost say that it's like a key that fits into the brain of a bird and the bird mistakes it for a thorn. The bird has a rose thorn shaped lock. If that sounds a little bit mysterious, I hope I'll explain it in a moment because I'm going to use the analogy of a lock and key. Whenever we see an apparently well-designed animal or plant, it's as if nature has the lock and the creature has the key. The thing about a lock and key is that the key has an intricate structure which is very hard to imitate and that structure exactly fits the lock. This key fits precisely into the lock and the holes in the key fit the teeth in the lock and the lock therefore opens. Just any old bit of bent wire won't do. It has to be the right key. The principle of the lock and key is that there's something intrinsically improbable in the shape of the key. You need that key to open the lock. In the case of an ordinary lock that you open with a key, it's not easy to measure how improbable the key is. But here's a combination lock, an ordinary bicycle lock. Here we know exactly how improbable it is because there are three dials and each one has six positions. That means there are six times six times six possibilities, which is 216. There's a 1 in 216 chance of opening it by luck. And here's a model of the same combination lock, so we can see how it works. You have to get all three of the dials into position. This one's combination is 6, 5, 1, and the lock opens. All three of the teeth have to be lined up. It isn't enough just to have one of them. But the lock is just a parable. Let's get back to real life. If the thorn bug is a key, what this means is that just any old shape won't do. It must be the exact shape of a rose thorn. A stick insect must be the exact shape of a stick. An upper tooth must fit, bite snugly against, 
the lower teeth in your jaw. Yet the theory of evolution says that all these things evolved gradually, stage by stage. This means that they must have gone through intermediates when they were not a perfect key fitting a lock. The thorn bug must have been half like a thorn. The stick insect must have been half like a stick. But who ever heard of a key that only half fitted a lock? A key either fits a lock or it doesn't. So how do real living creatures manage to evolve their perfection? How do they manage to survive the intermediate stages? How do they work when they're only half a key? Well, let's approach the problem by going back to the combination lock. While I've been talking, Bryson's been discreetly doctoring his lock so that it behaves in a different way. If you could imagine a lock where instead of having to get all the dials in place at once, supposing I was trying to crack a safe and there was money in there, as it is, I can't do it because I've got to get all the dials in place at once. And I've only got a 1 in, in 216 chance of doing that. In a real bank safe, it would be 1 in billions. I can't do it. But suppose that I were able to try the first one at random and eventually find how to open that. And then the safe door peeps open a little bit and a little bit of money drops out. I've done that one. Now I can go on to the next one. And I find out where, how to open that one. I've only got a 1 in 6 chance. That's fine. And a little bit more money spills out. And now the final wheel, I've only got one in six chance, that's easy, and I open the entire safe. It's now become a gradualistic combination lock, whereas before it was an all or nothing combination lock. With this lock, the maximum number of tries that you need in order to open it by luck is not 216, but a mere 18. So it's easy to open a gradualistic combination lock. And I call this smearing out the luck, because we don't have to get our luck all in one ridiculously large dollop. Instead, we can get our luck in dribs and drabs, each drib being allowed to count before the next drab. And we go on to wait for the next bit of luck. It accumulates. So what have we seen so far? Although an animal may look like a key fitting a lock, it's not a totally good analogy, because in this case, half a key is better than no key. If nature is a combination lock, it's a gradualistic combination lock, not an all or nothing one. Now let's look at the same thing from another direction. It's been said that a monkey typing at random on a typewriter could eventually write the complete works of Shakespeare. Well, I once did this experiment with my then 11-month-old daughter, Juliet, and uh, this is what she typed. I let her go for a bit, um, and so on and so on. And I realized after a bit that I'd have to let her go on for at least a billion years before she got even a single phrase of Shakespeare. The eminent astronomer, Sir Fred Hoyle, has pointed out that it's just about as unlikely that any complex living structure could spring into existence suddenly by luck alone. He said, it's rather like taking a junkyard and letting a hurricane blow through it. And the hurricane has the luck to spontaneously assemble a Boeing 747. So here's our junkyard, and the hurricane comes along, and it blows like this. And Hoyle's point is that the luck that would be necessary to spontaneously assemble a Boeing 747 like that is equivalent to the luck that you would need in order to get something like an eye 